Hello students, welcome to lecture 5 of the online course on Photonic Crystals, Fundamentals and Applications. Today's topic will be on electromagnetism as an eigenvalue problem. So here is the lecture outline. So we will look into the macroscopic Maxwell's equations, then we will introduce electromagnetism as an eigenvalue problem, what it means for an operator to be an Hermitian. We will discuss about the general properties of the harmonic modes, we will introduce the concept of orthogonality and present electromagnetic energy, how to compute that and the variational principle and then we will discuss about why we prefer magnetic fields versus electric fields in these calculations. So, the first topic will be will be covering macroscopic Maxwell's equations. So, in order to study the propagation of light in photonic crystal, we begin with Maxwell's equation and this we have already seen in the previous lectures. So, these are the four Maxwell's equations which are nothing but Gauss law, Gauss law for magnetism, Faraday's law and the Ampere's Maxwell's law. So, these are basically two divergence equation and two curl equations that uh, correlate electric and magnetic field with uh, electric displacement field and magnetic induction field along with uh, rho and j which are basically free charge and current densities. So, in this discussion we restrict ourselves to propagation within a mixed dielectric medium. So, when we say mixed dielectric medium it is basically a composite of uh, regions of homogeneous dielectric material as a function of the Cartesian position vector which is r ok in which the structure does not vary with time and there are no free charges or current. So, you can actually see small islands of different permittivity, but each of this region are basically homogeneous. So, this is a overall a composite of the macroscopic regions ok. So, what is important here to note that there are no charges or currents and this composite need not be periodic. So, with this type of medium in mind in which the light propagates, but there are no sources of light. So, we can set rho equals 0 and j equals 0. So, now we relate the electric displacement field to electric field and magnetic induction field or magnetic flux density to the magnetization field or magnetic field ok and that is done via the constitutive relations. So, these are the two constitutive relations where d as a function of r can be written as epsilon naught, epsilon r. So, here the permittivity is basically function of position and also electric field which is also function of position. Similarly, b r can be written as mu naught mu r h r. So, for most dielectric materials of interest the relative magnetic permeability which is mu r is found to be very close to 1. So, you can simply put this as 1 that simplifies your this equation and you can write it as b equals mu naught h for simplicity. So, under this kind of assumption the Maxwell's equation will look like this. So, you can write del dot h r t which is 0 ok and del dot d equals 0 and d can be written as epsilon r ok epsilon uh, e t or e r t and these are the two curl equations. So, curl of e is nothing but minus dot b dot t. So, if you take the term on the left hand side and b you can write as mu naught h you get this particular equation. Similarly, the fourth equation where j equals 0 you can write it as curl of h equals uh, dot d dot t. So, that can be taken on the left side and you can write curl of h minus epsilon naught epsilon r dot e dot t equals 0. So, in general both e and h fields are complicated functions of both time and space because the Maxwell's equations are linear. However, we can separate the time dependence from the spatial dependence by expanding the fields into a set of harmonic modes. So, we will examine these restrictions that Maxwell's equation impose on the field pattern that varies sinusoidally or you can say harmonically with time. There is no great limitation since we know 
that by Fourier analysis, we can build any solution with an appropriate combination of this harmonic modes. So, often we will refer them simply as modes or states of the system. So, we do not call them harmonic modes all the time, but we can simply call them modes. For mathematical convenience, employ the standard trick of using a complex valued field and remembering to take the real part of it to obtain the physical field. And this will allow us to write the harmonic field as a spatial pattern, which is also known as the mode profile times a complex exponential. So, mathematically that field can be written as this. So, h which is a function of position and time can be written as h r which is only having special dependence and then you have a time uh, exponential which is e to the power minus i omega t. Okay? So, this is the complex uh, exponential. So, similarly the form for magnetic field can also be written for electric field and you get this particular equation. So, to find the equations governing the mode profiles for a given frequency, what you can do? You can insert the above equations into the Maxwell's equation. Okay? So, when you put them into the Maxwell's equation, so these are the Maxwell's equation that you have seen in the previous slide. Okay? You can obtain the two divergence equation which are simply this del dot h r equals 0 and you will find del dot epsilon r epsilon epsilon r e r equals 0. Now, these two equations have very simple uh, physical interpretation. Okay? So, there are no point sources or sink of displacement and magnetic field in the medium. So, this is the physical interpretation of this two particular equation. Now, equivalently the field configuration are built up of electromagnetic waves that are transverse. So, if we have a plane wave that is expressed as h r equals a exponential i k dot r. So, k is the wave vector and uh, r is the position vector. Okay? So, in this case the above mentioned divergence equation okay, of uh, this one will require that a dot k the dot product of these two should be 0. Now, you can use the two curl equations which basically correlate electric field with magnetic field. So, you can write this from the third Maxwell's equation. So, curl of E equals you know uh, minus I omega mu naught h r. So, you have actually you know taken that um, time dependence and try to write this down. Okay? So, if you remember the time dependence that you have seen here. So, you can take this. Okay? So, e to the power minus i omega t, you can take the time derivative of it that will give you that i omega term that comes in the, uh, that comes over here. Right? So, this is how you can write that. So, similarly, the fourth equation can be written like this. So, decouple these equations by dividing the right side equation by epsilon r. So, if you divide this by epsilon r, you will only have the expression for e r. Okay? And then you take it on the other side, you take a curl of that. So, okay, and that curl can be equated to this one because this is also curl of E t. So, the mathematics is pretty simple here. I urge all of you who were not able to you know visualize this, you can do it on pen and paper, and you will see that you can actually eliminate E r from the expression by using this two expression, and you can have everything in terms of h. Okay, and uh, the constant is epsilon naught and mu naught can be combined to yield the vacuum speed of light that is c equals 1 over square root of mu naught epsilon naught. Okay? And the result is an equation that entirely depends on h r. Okay? So, you can finally have the expression looking like this. So, which is curl of this parameter which is 1 by epsilon naught and then curl of h r. Okay? And that is equal to omega by c whole square h r. So, this is the master equation and together with the divergence equation that is del dot h r equals 0 that tells us everything about the magnetic field.
and the beauty of the system is that once you know everything about the magnetic field you can find everything about the electric field also because they are correlated okay so for a given structure epsilon r we solve for the master equation to find out the modes of hr and its corresponding frequencies okay subject to the transversality requirement so this is the equation the master equation and this is the fourth maxwell's equation that correlates the curl of h with er okay so you can also find out from here what is er in terms of curl of h okay and you can also find h r in terms of er okay so this is how you can obtain one and then get the other now using this process guarantees that electric field um, satisfied the transversality requirement that is divergence of d is zero because the divergence of a curl is always zero right so in this case what is understood that we do not require two transversality constraint rather we can only impose one and that will give us one particular field and from that you can obtain the other field fine so now we will move on to you know formulate electromagnetism as an eigenvalue problem so the heart of the maxwell's equation for harmonic mode in a dielectric medium can be written as this okay so this is nothing but a differential equation of hr okay and uh, the content of this equation if you see that you are basically performing a series of operations on the magnetic field hr okay and if hr is really and uh, allowable electromagnetic mode okay the result that you are obtaining on the right side is nothing but a constant times the original function hr okay so what is the function here you first take a curl then you divide that curl by epsilon r and then again you take the curl of that entire quantity so you are actually basing a lot of operations on the magnetic field and at the end what do you get you are again getting that magnetic field function times a constant so this kind of uh, situation arises often in mathematical physics and uh, these are called eigenvalue problem so if the result of an operation on a function is just the function itself multiplied by some constant then that function is called the eigen function or eigen vector for that particular operator and the multiplicative constant that you see here is called an eigen value right so assume that the left side of the ma master equation so this is the master equation so all these things if you op if you you know assume that as an operator theta cap which is acting on magnetic field okay then this master equation can be rewritten like this that you have a maxwell operator that operates on magnetic field and gives you a constant times that same function so it looks pretty much like the eigenvalue problem so what is this uh, theta cap this is basically the differential operator that takes the curl of magnetic field divides with you know epsilon r and then again takes another curl okay so this is this operator so curl of h is basically this sorry theta cap h r is basically this so theta cap is a linear operator now the eigen vector so h r is eigen vectors okay so which are basically the spatial patterns of the harmonic modes and uh, omega square by c square that you see here are basically proportional to the squared frequencies of those modes so omega is basically the frequency of the particular eigen mode so we can assume that the left side okay so this we have already seen that this is typically how the you know maxwell's equation or the master equation looks like more of a eigenvalue problem and we have also understood that this operator maxwell operator theta cap is a linear operator and uh, for any linear combination of the solution will again be a solution right so we can actually assume that if h1r and h2r both are the solutions of this master equation with 
same frequency omega then a combination of that say alpha h1 r plus beta h2 r where alpha and beta are constant that is also a solution of the master equation. For example, given a certain mode profile we can construct another legitimate mode profile with the same frequency by simply doubling the you know field strength everywhere. So, you can choose alpha equals 2 so that will dub double up the magnetic field strength everywhere and that will also be a solution. So, for this region uh, we consider two field patterns that differ only by an overall multiplier to be the same mode. So, we actually you know consider those as same mode because they just only differ by a multiplying factor ok. So, the operator notation that you see here is pretty similar to that of quantum mechanics in which an eigenvalue function is basically obtained by operating on wave function with the Hamiltonian h cap ok. So, you can see that in quantum mechanics and electrodynamics if you put them side by side this is the wave function ok or wave uh, scalar potential ok. So, if you compare quantum mechanics and electrodynamics side by side you can see the field is expressed as this in quantum mechanics whether in electrodynamics we represent it by this which you have seen earlier. So, the eigenvalue here eigenvalue problem here looks like h cap psi equals e psi whereas in this case this is the eigenvalue problem. So, you have uh, theta cap h equals omega by c whole square into h. So, this kind of operator notation is very similar to that of quantum mechanics. So, we are basically uh, an eigenvalue equation is obtained by operating on the wave function with the Hamiltonian here. So, here the key properties of the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian will be to have real eigenvalues ok. They will be orthogonal, they can be obtained by variational principle and they can be categorized by their symmetric properties. And all these properties also you know hold for the formulation of electrode magnetism right. So, now let us look into what it means for an operator to be an Hermitian ok. So, theta cap which is the Maxwell's operator is a special type of linear operator which is known as a Hermitian operator. So, what is that Hermitian operator ok and what does it take uh, for an operator to be Hermitian. So, this is the master equation ok. So, for an Hermitian operator the inner product of two vector fields. So, if you take f r and g r the their inner product can be written as this. So, it is a volume integral of one uh, like f conjugate times you know or dot g r. Hmm? So, note that a simple consequence of this definition will be that the inner product of f g is nothing but g f conjugate and that is true for any f and g ok. Now, if you take the inner product of a uh, vector field with itself. So, you can write uh, f f which is always real and non negative even if f is complex. So, in fact, if uh, f r is a harmonic mode of our electromagnetic system, we, we can always set that uh, the inner product of f uh, with itself is 1 and by using our freedom to scale any mode by you know an overall multiplier. So, this actually if you set this you can get the freedom of scaling any mode by a multiplier. So, given f prime r where you know the inner product of f prime with itself is not 1, you can write f as f prime r divided by whatever is that value right. So, from the previous discussion we understand that uh, f r is basically the same mode as f prime r just that it differs uh, only by overall multiplier. Hmm. But now we have this inner product of f with itself is 1 that means f r is basically normalized and normalized modes are very useful in formal arguments. If uh, however, 
if uh, one is interested in the physical energy of the mode and not just its uh, spatial profile, then the overall multiplier is also important because normalized will not tell you exactly about the um, actual physical energy of that field. It will only show you the spatial profile. So, you need to know the overall multiplier to know the exact value of the physical fields. Next, okay, let us assume that an operator psi cap, capital psi cap is Hermitian. Okay. If the inner product of f with this psi g is same as you know psi f comma g, okay, the inner product of this with this and that is true for any vector field f and g. That is it does not matter which function is operated upon before taking the inner product. So, if you either op like take um, the you operate the function on g and then you take the inner product or you operate the function on f and you take the inner product, the inner product should come out to be same. In that case, you know you can say that function is Hermitian. So, obviously you can understand that not all operators are Hermitian. Now, we have to show that the Maxwell's operator theta cap is Hermitian. So, in that case, uh, we perform an integration by parts twice. So, you take this kind of you know f uh, theta cap g. So, you write down the inner product. Okay. So, this is your theta cap g, right? And here you can actually use two identities, two vector identities. One is the uh, divergence of uh, this f cross g can be written as you know curl of f dot product with g minus f dot product with curl of g. Okay? So, here you will see that you are getting this kind of uh, situation where you are getting curl of this parameter. So, you can actually use this vector identity and find out what it is. So, this can be written as curl of f times okay, g. So, you can actually obtain this from this one okay. and then integrating both sides and applying the divergence theorem, you can finally figure out that integration of f dot curl of g will be same as you know integration of curl of f dot g okay, plus s surface term and uh, that term typically from the integral of uh, curl of uh, sorry from the integral of uh, this term okay, uh, del dot f cross g that surface term basically vanishes. So, you can actually write it in terms of this. So, which tells that you can operate theta cap on f and then g you take the inner product and that will result into the same. So, that establishes the fact that theta cap the Maxwell operator is a Hermitian operator. So, you are just repeating this okay, here telling uh, or highlighting that we have performed you know integration by parts and uh, neglect the surface term that involve the values of field at the boundary of integration. So, this is because in all cases of interest okay, you can neglect the term because of two things. Um, one of these things will be true either the field will decay to 0 at large distance or the field is basically periodic in the region of integration. So, in the these two cases you can you know neglect the surface term okay, and that involves the value of the field at the boundaries of the integration fine. So, that establishes that theta cap or the Maxwell operator is a Hermitian operator right. So, now we will look into the general properties of the harmonic modes. So, having established that theta cap is the Hermitian operator, it can be shown that the eigenvalues of theta cap must be real numbers. Okay? Suppose H r the magnetic field okay, or the spatial profile of the magnetic field is an eigenvector of theta cap with the eigenvalue of omega by c whole square. Okay? It means okay, you can take the inner product of the master equation, you can write like this, 
okay and you are getting this eigenvalue and again this particular eigenvector. In short, you can write in terms of theta cap operator, this is how it will look like. Now, if you take inner product of h and this thing, what do you get? You will get, you know, omega square by c square and inner product of h with, with itself, okay. If you take the conjugate of this, you will get conjugate of um, omega square by c square conjugate and then you have the inner product of h with itself. So, because theta cap is a Hermitian operator, so this can be written as this. So, it does not matter where you are applying the operator, the inner product remains same and here the function is basically h, okay. Both vector fields are basically same. So, additionally from the division uh, definition, additionally from the definition of the inner product, we also know that h and then psi cap h will be equal to psi cap h comma h conjugate for any operator psi cap, okay. So, if you use these two information together, you can write that h theta cap h conjugate will be equal to omega square by c square conjugate and then the inner product of h with itself and this can be written as this, okay, from here, okay, and that is simply omega square by c square and inner product of h with itself. So, what we obtain from here is that omega square by c square conjugate is basically omega square by c square. That means, omega square is basically omega square conjugate. That means, omega square is basically real, okay, and then this inner product Okay, it is very easy that when you set f equals g equals h in this particular equation, okay, you basically get this inner product of h with h omega by c whole square that can be written as this turns out to be now f and g are both equal and they are both h. So, there are curl of h twice. So, you have curl of h whole square okay, and this is how the equation looks like. So, here since epsilon r is positive everywhere, the integrand on the right side is also everywhere non-negative. So, that means you can say that this operator theta cap the Maxwell operator is basically a positive semi-definite. Therefore, all the eigenvalues omega square are basically non-negative and omega is also real. In addition, the Hermicity of uh, theta cap forces any two harmonic modes h 1 r and h 2 r with different frequencies omega 1 and omega 2 to have an inner product of 0. So, let us consider two normalized modes like h 1 r and h 2 r and they are having a frequency of omega 1 and omega 2 respectively. So, you can write omega 1 square okay, inner product of h 2 and h 1 equals c square h 2 and then theta cap h 1 that will be same as c square okay, theta cap h 2 comma h 1 and that can be written as omega 2 square h 1 h 2 h 1. So, if you take this two together, okay, you can write omega 1 square minus omega 2 square and the inner product of h 2 h 1. Now, omega 1 and omega 2 are not uh, 0, uh, sorry omega 1 and omega 2 are not equal. So, this term will not be 0 that means, this has to be 0 and this is 0 means you know h 1 and h 2 are basically orthogonal modes. So, two harmonic modes with equal frequencies if they are equal then they need not be you know orthogonal. So, this term need not be orthogonal and we can say if the two modes are having same frequencies we can say that they are degenerate. So, now let us introduce the concept of orthogonality. For two real one dimensional functions if you take f x and g x they are orthogonal if you know you can write the inner product of f and g as integration f x d x f x g x d x equals 0. So, in a sense the product f g must be negative at least 
as much as it is positive over the integral of interest and then only it can become 0, right? So, for example, if you take familiar set of functions like f and x and you can write it as sin n pi x over l, they are all orthogonal in the interval from x equals 0 to x equals l. So, you understand over the integral some part of the function has to be positive, some part has to be negative and then only they can be you know the net integral can vanish. So, note that each of this function has a different number of modes and the locations can be found from f n x equals 0 and remember not including the endpoints. So, in particular f n has n minus 1 nodes. So, the product of any two different f n is positive as often as it is negative. So, that you know the inner product vanishes. So, that is the whole idea of orthogonality fine. Now, let us look into how do we calculate electromagnetic energy and apply the variational principle. So, although the harmonic modes in a dielectric medium can be quite complicated, there is a simple way to understand some of their qualitative features. Roughly a mode tends to concentrate its electrical energy or electric field energy in the region of high dielectric constant while remaining orthogonal to the modes below it in frequency. You understand the orthogonality right. So, f x integration f x g x will be 0 something like that ok. For mode it is slightly more complicated, but the idea is that though same. This useful, but somewhat vague notion can be expressed precisely through the electromagnetic variational theorem, which is analogous to the variational principle of quantum mechanics. In particular, the smallest eigenvalue, which is omega naught square by c square and thus the lowest frequency mode corresponds to the field pattern that minimizes the functional. So, you can define a functional like this u f of h, where it is inner product of h theta cap h and then inner product of divided by h with h that is the inner product ok. So, if you consider omega naught square by c square is the minimum of this functional over all conceivable uh, field patterns h ok, which are subject to the transversality um, constraint that is del dot h will be 0 ok. The functional u of h is also called uh, Rayleigh quotient and it appears in a similar variational theorem for any Hermitian operator. So, we, we will basically refer to this u f uh, as uh, electromagnetic energy functional in order to stretch its analogy with the variational theorems in uh, quantum and classical mechanics that minimizes a physical energy. So, to verify the claim that u f is basically minimized for the lowest frequency mode, let us consider how small variations in h r affect the energy functional. So, suppose that we perturb the magnetic field h r by adding a small amplitude function which is delta h r ok. So, what is the resulting small change delta u f in the energy functional? So, it should be 0 if the energy functional is really at minimum, thus an ordinary derivative of the function will vanish at the extremum. To find out let us evaluate the energy functional at h plus delta h and at h and then compute the difference which is delta u f. So, evaluating the energy functional at h delta h this is how the equation looks like and you also have the energy functional at h ok. So, the difference between these two is basically delta u f h ok which is this one. 
Now, if you ignore the terms higher than the first order in delta H, okay, so you can write delta UF in terms of this, which is delta H comma G, the inner product of this plus G comma delta H, the inner product of this by 2. So, where G H can be defined as this one. So, it is basically 2 divided by the near product of h and then you have that operator theta cap with h and then the ratio of this times h. Okay? So, what is this? This g is basically interpreted as a gradient which is rate of change of the functional u f with respect to h. So, it is written as g h. Right? G as a function of H or you can say the gradient as a function of H. Now, at, the, at, an, extre at an extremum, delta UF must vanish. Right? That is how you find the minimum. For all possible shifts of delta H and that will show that the gradient is basically 0, G equals 0. This implies that the parenthesized quantity here should be 0. Okay, which is equivalent to saying that this is 0, which is again telling us that h is basically an eigenvector of theta cap. So, which is true. That means, u f is the functional is at an extremum if and only if h is in harmonic mode. So, more careful considerations will show us that the lowest frequency electromagnetic eigen mode H naught basically minimizes the energy functional U f. So, the next lowest energy okay, omega eigen mode will minimize U f within the subspace of the function that are orthogonal to H naught and so on. So, the next one will be orthogonal to this particular mode profile. So, the energy functional must be distinguished from the physical energy which is stored in the electromagnetic field. If you take the time averaged physical energy that can be separated into the contribution coming from electric field and also coming from the magnetic field and you can write U e that is basically the energy um, time averaged physical energy. So, you can write in terms of the electric field. So, this is the contribution from electric field, this is the contribution coming from magnetic field. So, in a harmonic mode, the physical energy is basically periodically exchanged between the electric field and the magnetic field. So, you can show that this energy can be totally converted into magnetic energy and back and forth. So, U e is same as U h. right? So, the physical energy and the energy functional are related, but remember there is an important difference. The energy functional has fields in both the numerator and the denominator and is therefore independent of the field strength. So, the physical energy is basically proportional to the square of the field strength. So, in other words multiplying the fields by a constant affects the physical energy, but it will not affect the energy functional because energy functional has got field in both numerator and denominator. So, if we are interested in the physical energy, we must pay attention to the amplitude of our modes. But if we are only interested in the mode profile, then we might as well normalize our modes. There, you know, the actual amplitude will not be seen, but the mode profile will be recorded. The rate of energy transport, which is given by the pointing vector s, can be written as s equals half real of you know e conjugate cross product with h. So, this is how you obtain the pointing vector. So, that actually tells you the direction of energy transport or energy flow. So, this is the time average flux of the electromagnetic energy in the direction of s per unit time and per unit area for a time harmonic field. So, we also sometimes refer to the component of S in a given direction as the light intensity. The ratio of the energy flux to the energy density defines the velocity of the 
energy transport right now towards the end of this lecture we will discuss why we discuss everything in terms of magnetic field instead of electric field so by now one should be asking this question that why we are always dealing with magnetic field instead of electric field in the previous section we reformulated the maxwell's equation as an eigen value equation for the high harmonic modes of magnetic field hr the idea was that for a given frequency we could solve for hr and then determine what is er by their you know correlation equations but we could have equally well tried an alternative approach for the electric field and determine the magnetic field later on now why didn't we choose that particular route so we'll see that there are certain difficulties and uh, because of which working with magnetic field is preferred so one can also find the condition on the electric field to be like this from the maxwell's equation okay therefore there are operators on the both sides of these equations and uh, it is referred to as a generalized eigen problem so it is a simple matter to convert this into a ordinary eigen problem by dividing by epsilon r then the operator is no longer hermitian so if we stick to the generalized eigen problem like here okay where there are operators on both sides however then the simple theorem which are analogous to those of the previous sections can be developed because the two operators of the generalized eigen problem one is karl of karl of this this one karl of karl and another one is epsilon r they can be shown to be both hermitian and positive semi definite so in particular it can be shown that omega is real and that the two solutions e1 and e2 with different frequencies satisfy an orthogonality relation something like e1 and then you have epsilon e2 okay which will be zero so for some analytical calculations such as you know derivation of the variational equation or the perturbation theory the electric field eigen problem is the most convenient starting point however it has one feature that turns out to be undesirable for numerical computation which is the transversality constraint so if you look at the constraint here it is del dot epsilon e equals 0 so you see this uh, transversality constraint depends on epsilon so we can restore a simpler transversality constraint by using d instead of e so it looks like del dot d equals 0 that means you have to deal with you know the displacement field instead of the electric field so in this equation you can substitute you know d by epsilon not uh, epsilon not epsilon this term can replace your e and then you divide both sides by epsilon to keep the hermitian operator and then you can actually obtain this kind of a so in this equation you are substituting for e you are putting d over epsilon not epsilon and then you are dividing both sides by epsilon to keep the operator hermitian and this above mentioned equation will yield this so you can see this is perfectly valid formulation of the problem but it is unnecessarily complicated because of the three factors of 1 by epsilon r that is getting into the picture as compared to a single factor which gets into the formulation of e h or e alone okay so this is an extra mathematical burden and that is why you know for mathematical convenience people prefer to work on h form for the numerical calculations so that is all for this lecture we'll start the discussion of uh, scaling properties of maxwell's equation in the next lecture if you have any doubt or query regarding this lecture at any point of time 
you can email me mentioning MOOC and Photonic Crystal on the email subject line and this is my email address. Thank you. Thank you.